the seven figure um, formula for the propulsion system. Uh, it's a very advanced alien science. And uh, if they have the figure now, they won't know what to do with it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, they will only go to the stars when they are ready because the space races won't allow them into space if they go on a warlike mission. Mm. They have to look after their planets and homes as well, mm -hmm. as well as the, the universe. Judging what's happening on planet Earth at the moment, we're not looking anywhere near ready, are we? No, no, no. <laughs> we're no. just not looking ready. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello everyone, Karen here, accentuating the positive as usual, presenting you another show. Today I'm so excited. I've got the beautiful Valerie O'Hogan coming on to talk with me. But Valerie's in South Africa, so we've only got him with very poor internet, she says. I think she's in the country. So we've only got about 30 minutes to talk. And Valerie is a friend of Elizabeth Clara, who I fell in love with after I had a conversation with Craig Campobasso on the show last year about his alien almanac book and all sorts of extraterrestrial races. He mentioned in passing Elizabeth's story oh so briefly, but along with all the other people he mentioned, I seemed to latch on to Elizabeth's name and I Googled her after the show and found her story and became completely obsessed with her story, passionate about her story. In fact, uh, mesmerized, mesmerized about her story and sent a message to the universe. Oh, I wish because Elizabeth has now passed, left her body in the early 90s. She was in her 80s when she finished her round this time on Earth. And I was thinking, I wish I could talk to somebody about this. I wish I could talk to somebody about this. And then I found Valerie, who says that she is continuing Elizabeth's work in spreading the information and knowledge about our star nation brothers and sisters. Elizabeth's story is amazing. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about it, because, as I said, we've only got half an hour with Valerie and Valerie's also written a book about her time with Elizabeth when she was here on Earth, growing up with Elizabeth in South Africa. Elizabeth wrote a book that came out in the 70s, I think 1976 it came out, or it was first published in English in the 80s, called Beyond the Light Barrier, which is an autobiographical story of her life and her relationship with an off-world star being she fell madly in love with. In fact, I think that even before she incarnated into her human form, she was already in a relationship with a being called Archon, an astrophysicist from Meton, a planet of Proxima Centauri at a distance of about 4.3 light years from our planet and is our nearest stellar neighbour. Elizabeth was taken in Archon's spaceship to Meton, the planet in Alpha Centauri, where he lives, abides, where she lived with him and his family for four months and where she bore his child. They had a child together called Ailing, not alien, Ailing. <laughs> Her life on Meton is fantastically described in her book, Beyond the Light Barrier. And Archon brought Elizabeth back to Earth after the birth of their son and continued to visit her uh, here on Earth, coming in his spaceship. Archon explained how his spaceship light propulsion technology operates in the book, how it allowed him and his people to travel across vast interstellar distances. This technology is explained in detail in the book. Elizabeth was given a standing ovation at the 11th International Congress of UFO Research Group at Wiesenbaden in 1975, and her speech as a guest of honour was applauded by scientists of 22 nations. 
but Elizabeth had an amazing life. She was born in uh, the Murray River, Natal, and at the age of seven, her and her older sister had their first encounter with the spaceship uh, near their parents' farmhouse in the midlands of the Awasi Zulu Natal Midlands in South Africa. She witnessed a plummeting pocket meteor, which was interpreted by a silver disc bathed in a pearly luster. She matriculated from St Anne's Diocesan College in Peter Martinsburg in South Africa and moved to Florence, Italy to study art and music. She completed a four year diploma in meteorology at Cambridge University and learned to fly a light aircraft. I think one of her husbands was working, it it's, tells you all this in the book, was working in the Air Force and uh, taught her to fly. And they also, the two of them also saw Archon's ship during a flight. After reading George Adamski's Flying Saucers Have Landed in 1955, Clara recalled that she had been receiving occasional telepathic messages from a friendly star nation being who was called Archon since she was a child. She was able to take photos of the ship from the Drakensberg or the Drakenberg Mountain in the mid-50s. Elizabeth called down Akon and his scout ship on April 7th, 1956 for an actual landing and she was carried up to the mothership in Earth's orbit and was eventually transported to Akon's home planet Meton, orbiting nearby the multiple star system Alpha Centauri where she and Akon made love delivering a male child, Aileen, who stayed behind on Meton to be educated while Elizabeth came home. The whole process, trip, lovemaking, pregnancy, delivering and return trip, took less than four months in Earth years and Elizabeth took far more time before publishing the book Beyond the Light Barrier about her extraterrestrial adventures. But she talks about how time is completely different. It actually goes into the whole process of time in the book. What, what was four months on Earth was about nine years where she was living in Meton. Uh, yeah, it goes into to time. I've written a whole thing about time. It says, this is a quote out out of the book, as now you understand, my dear, Sharon gently said, Archon communicated with you many years ago from the other side of the rainbow and you knew that he was there, out there in another existence of space-time, living in another solar system within the same galaxy. Earth time is only what you make of it because of the speed of Earth in orbit around the sun the earth's rotation and the speed of the entire system around the vast disks of galaxy according to the system's position in the galaxy and relative to our position in the galaxy our home system gives us another dimension in time and space creation is infinite continuous creation and the evolution gives to the mind of humankind the speed of time time is the process of thinking into the fourth dimension added to the third dimension of matter or planetary surfaces matched by the perpetual motion of the inner consciousness to the perpetual motion of the galaxy in different time speeds to each and every other solar system. Venus, the cradle of humankind, remain shrouded and bereft of life after uh, the, oh, no, that's that's something else. But, yes, so these people were from Venus originally, uh, millions of years before what we now understand of Earth, but our sun sent a supernova out into the system and destroyed all life on Venus and the civilization that lived on Venus moved because they were already a space space civilization then they moved to the alpha centauri star system and inhabited the seven planets in the system with two stars their suns and they inhabit all seven planets in that system and meton is one of them where archon comes from it's fascinating isn't it just fascinating and elizabeth was able to go and live there for a period of time 
and it describes how she was able to do that. There's much more to the story that I'd love to discuss with her. I'll have to talk to her telepathically from where she is because it says in the book that she uh, was vastly different to the rest of her family. She looked very different and she looked more like the beings that lived on Meton, the Venusian beings that lived on Meton, and that she was actually one of them that was implanted on Earth to live out a human life and then to reconnect to her star family and tell people about their civilization. It is just fascinating. And this was all happening in the 50s <laughs> before I was born. And uh, the book got uh, many accolades, actually. Um, Albert Einstein says this about the book. The most beautiful and most profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is the shower of all true science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead to know that what is impenetrable to us really exists manifesting itself as the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty which our dull primitive primitive can comprehend <laughs> this is what he says only in their primitive forms this knowledge is the feeling of the center of true religiousness hmm. that's what he said about the book this book is about time oh gosh I'm busy. Do you mind? <laughs> this is what Elizabeth said about her book. I'll read it to you. This book is about time on a cosmic level with new data not yet registered on a scientific, on our scientific instruments. The reader needs to follow the cosmic layout of my writing very closely to understand the vast implications involved. Otherwise, the cosmic scale of this book will be lost and misunderstood by many whose intelligence cannot be expanded in this epoch of time to a consciousness aware of our cosmic connections. Oh, beautiful. I have to say, I just love this book. I absolutely love it. I would really love to see this book as a movie. It's so rich. Apart from Elizabeth being a brilliant writer, she's so descriptive in her, in her writing, it, it takes us on a journey to South Africa and the Drakensberg Mountains and uh, oh, the plateaus of the mountains and the Zulu nations. And then it takes us off world into the science of anti-gravitic propulsion in these amazing spaceships, which, you know, beyond when we were still primitive cavemen, <laughs> were still traversing the cosmos outside of time and space into a future we can only imagine. And uh, her description of her experience on the spaceship and the beings who inhabit the spaceships and also the planet and how they lived. What I love about this book is how they live in a utopian society as we crawl around on planet Earth, bumping up against the contrast provided for us here, the wars and pandemics and sickness and death. These people live far beyond those um, challenges, I suppose, in this utopian society where they're absolutely in communion with nature, not just the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, but nature that is the universe and the cosmos, completely connected to the source of all beings, the source of everything, that which we call God, this energy this vortex of energy that is profound liquid love and they operate their world from this understanding that we are all one and connected to this energy and we are this energy. It's just beautiful and utopian. So as I imagine a movie made out of this book, I, I see the the vast expanse of the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa and the Zulu nations and uh, how they talk about the iron birds in the sky as they see the spaceships, not just the planes. 
and then back into the 50s and uh, there's still the Cold War element where the Russians are wanting, are understanding that there is life in the cosmos and they're wanting the science and the intelligence of the propulsion system of the craft and the energy system of the craft, like the governments are vying for this, this, um, this, this intelligence, this scientific intelligence. And actually they were following, they were following Elizabeth and trying to capture her. There's a scene in the book where it's just like a Hollywood movie. She gets captured and she has to escape and it's sort of nefarious. Uh, yeah, I, just, I just see it as a movie. There's so much. And then, of course, she has this love affair and there is this amazing love affair that she has with Archon. And I think Elizabeth was quite little, looking at photographs of her standing next to her niece. Her niece towers over her. And I don't know how tall Valerie is. I'll have to, we'll have to ask her. And Archon was about six foot four, so he would have been a lot taller than her. And uh, he, they have they have access to knowledge like we just can't imagine. I would imagine that the science of that day is probably known by our governments now. I'm not sure. But she had to, sh to sign a um, secrecy ag agreement that she wouldn't release the information because the beings of the Alpha Centauri system or, or originally Venus said that humanity in its current consciousness back in the 50s and probably still today in 2022 were not advanced enough to use the information in a way that wouldn't hurt all life you know they would turn it into weaponry and um yeah instead of using it to traverse the cosmos and to be a part of a cosmic family adding to the life in the cosmos instead of trying to destroy life <laughs> we're, so, we're so destructive here on earth look what's happening in europe at the moment ukraine and russia so yes i don't blame them for not giving uh, humans that uh, that knowledge and uh, then she goes into her experiences being on the ship also being pregnant and giving birth in a different dimension in a different world which is a very different experience to how we give birth as human beings here on earth, including how she gave birth to her former children as a human and uh, what they, the, they eat and how they live on this planet and the materials they use, the clothes they wear. They're all vegetarians. They, uh, they don't have any animal product in their eating habits. The food is <clears throat> a bit like hydroponics here today. It's grown on the ship in liquid nutrients. And um, she talks about, uh, I have a friend who's been on the show, David, who is a pearl businessman. And he says that he looked up at Venus when he was young and said, I'll be here for as long as I'm needed, but I can't wait to get home. <laughs> so he knows himself to be from Venus. And he loved this book because they talked about pearl and how they use pearl to build their houses. Can you imagine a bath? Um, being in a bath in, in beautiful liquid soapy warm water in a bath made of pearl so pearls just aren't little tiny beads like we have on earth you can actually build staircases and bathrooms out of pearl and they use pearl for energy and to decorate their homes and yeah it's amazing so he was taken by that and it's all explained in the book a lot along with a lot of science it's quite it's quite amazing so the book's got the romance factor it's got the mystical factor being from off world and outer space uh, it's got the um, the scenery factor the south african factor and the zulu factor and the, the love between uh, you know archon and elizabeth and also her love for her family here on earth and she, the struggles that she had here on earth she had a couple of husbands a few husbands and she had a few struggles here on earth and it doesn't go into too much of that but it goes into a little bit of that yeah there's just so much it's so rich it's just so rich so Valerie's coming on in about 15 minutes and we're going to chat to her about her book and what she remembers about her time with Elizabeth and we'll get to know Valerie a little bit so I hope you enjoy the show. Well, here is Valerie O'Hogan all the way in South Africa to chat to us today about her experiences with Elizabeth and her new book. Welcome to the show, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. 
So she's in South Africa. It's night. It's uh, evening here and morning there. And your internet's not the best. So we've only got about 30 minutes. So I'm going to read a little bit of, about uh, Valerie and what she's been up to. Valerie O'Hogan is the niece of Elizabeth Clara, the South African woman who became well known at the end of the uh, 20th century for the book Beyond the Light Barrier, which chronicles Elizabeth's life and her experiences with the off-world being called Archon, whose civilization was originally from Venus and who now inhabits the planet called Meton in the Alpha Centauri star system. An amateur astronomer since childhood, Valerie belonged to many astronomical societies in South Africa and worldwide, meeting Patrick Moore and Jack Bennett, who discovered the Bennett's Comet. That's exciting. Valerie yeah. concluded an Education X series program in astrophysics and cosmology through the Australian National University uh, with a lecturing professor who won the Nobel Prize, taking part in various modules in astronomy through the Open University UK and participated in taking photographs and observations with the online remote telescope at Tenerife to contribute, Tenerife. Tenerife mm -hmm. to contribute to and record the light curves of variable stars and assisted professional astronomers with their work which is ongoing as a civil as a citizen scientist so did you come to australia to study or did you study remotely no it was remotely it was online ah beautiful and you also completed various uh, education modules in theology and english as well as modules in meteorology through harvard university you've been a busy girl Valerie <laughs> appeared on the USA Jeff Wren's show speaking about Elizabeth along with uh, other friends and family which had a rerun due to the excess of the first show as well as appearing twice on ABC's three talk television show and ETV's morning live show in the early 2000s. Valerie has written her book about her time with Elizabeth called my Memories of Elizabeth Clara, released in September 2021, a personal book of memories and information shared with Valerie by Elizabeth and a companion book to Elizabeth's book, Beyond the Light Barrier. Valerie enjoys music, art, gardening, reading, writing books and meditating and is continuing Elizabeth Clara's mission to inform humanity about our star nation brothers and sisters who exist beyond the light barrier very exciting it's such an honor to talk to you today you know I read the book Thank you. because somebody <laughs> on the show Craig Campobasso had mentioned Elizabeth just ever so slightly in passing and he had mentioned many people because we were talking about all sorts of extraterrestrial races and I picked up on that in our two-hour conversation and I looked her up and found the book and just became absolutely mesmerized by her story. And I said to the universe, I want to speak to somebody about this. Who can I speak to? <laughs> I didn't know anybody. And obviously Elizabeth had left her physical body. And then I came across you and I'm like, oh, there you are. Still <laughs> continuing the mission. So <laughs> blessings all the way from South Africa. And I know your book is not on Amazon because you say that no. it's too difficult for you to get up on Amazon, which we could probably uh, rectify. But how do people find your book? Well, um, they can email me. Um, I'll give you my email address. It's um, margaretvalerie at hotmail.com. But at the moment, uh, I'm only selling it in South Africa. Because, first of all, there's that uh, hiccup with Amazon that I've got to try and solve. I don't know when that will be. Uh, any other platforms I have to look into because um, I've got to see how they work. And uh, also, you know, to send it by courier is rather expensive. It's actually very expensive. <laughs> uh, I mean, to Australia alone, it's about 720 rand, South African rand. Are you, um, are you selling courier? Are you selling the PDF? You can sell the PDF. You can get people. I to download. don't know how. 
Yeah, but I don't know how to do that. Oh, it's that's... very simple. I can teach you how to do that. It's very simple. Okay, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, being in Australia, it's the same with Australians. In order to put a book on Amazon, we have to have a, a American bank account, and that's easy to do to just uh, yep. apply you see, for they an don't American have... bank account. Yeah, but they don't, um, I don't know how to do that. It's it's actually quite complicated for me. So there's all these new things that I've got to um, look into and understand and work my way through them. Yeah. So for the moment, I'm just doing it the old fashioned way, just in South Africa. But if anybody knows of family or friends in South Africa, that they are in contact with, they, those people can buy it from me and then forward the book to their family and friends overseas so that would be also a way to do it yeah and uh another way is uh, just to upload the pdf and get people to pay you for the pdf uh just through a paypal account that's another way of doing uh, i don't that. have paypal either <laughs> oh you can sign up for paypal for paypal anyone can sign up for paypal it's a global thing it's very simple yeah. but it sounds like you need some help and I can I help do. you a little bit but if there's Thank anyone you. out there with some technical can help Valerie you know get this book up on Amazon and uh, help her with this sort of thing you know let me know send me a message Thank put you. a message under or email me or email uh, Valerie okay well let's talk about the book that's the yeah. that's the front of it yeah beautiful okay. did it take you long to write it I'd written it several years ago, quite a few years ago. And initially, I just wrote it down for myself, for my own memories, so that I would always have something to read. Um, so it lay in my file, the manuscript lay in my file for a good many years. And then one day I decided, you know, I wonder if I can't get this published. Maybe I can just improve it a little and see um, if I can get this published. And um, I did approach publishers and they were very interested. And then I found one uh, in South Africa here in Natal where she edits and prints the book for me at a fraction of the cost. Um, so I decided to go with this lady and um, she has her own little company and she is very, very good. And so I decided to support her and also because she was in Natal where Elizabeth grew up, um, she's done a beautiful job. And Eleanor Danan designed the cover for me as well, very kindly. She designed this cover, Ooh, which is that one. Yes, it's beautiful. Yes, yes. So for the people listening yes. on audio, you'll have to go to the YouTube to have a look at what we're talking about. <laughs> and <laughs> tell us about your time with Elizabeth. So you were her, her niece. Are you her, her sister or brother's daughter? No, actually, um, I'm not her niece. I think maybe Eleanor got a little confused because oh. English is not her mother language, okay. although she does extremely well. Um, I could never speak French like that. I mean, she's an absolute star. Um, I'm a very close friend of Elizabeth. My grandfather's sister, my auntie Maisie Polkington, was a very close friend of Elizabeth. And um, I grew up, I can't even remember the first time I saw her. I was just so young. She, I've known her all my life, and uh, or at least most of it. And um, I used to go visit her in her cottage in Tarby, south of Johannesburg, during the school holidays. And we just got on so well. She was like a mother to me. I mean, obviously, I was at school. She was in her 60s. So she was massively older than me. She was like a mother or a grandmother to me. And um, she said to me, she said, you have every right to call me mom. We were very, very close. And she said, when she saw my eyes, she recognized me as her daughter from a previous life in the Pleiades. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I realized, yes, they, I did get the wrong information. I was, yeah, I did. I think that you were her niece. So she was in her 60s when you met her. How old were you? You were in your 20s? Oh, no, I was younger than that. Really? Yeah. How old were you? When you met, gosh, her. I was probably I was a young child. Oh, okay, you're a child. And how did yeah. you meet her? 
Yeah, it's so long ago, Karen, I can't even remember. <laughs> she was just always there, you know. It, it's like my little best friends um, when I was 10. I always knew them. I don't remember meeting them because I was so young. Yeah. But they were always there in my life. Yeah. And yeah. when she would talk to you about her experiences with Akon, you just immediately understood the information. You didn't yes. have to, like, be convinced. Could you tell us no. a little bit about that? What would she say to you? Um, she would tell me about Meeton and how they live there. And we'd often go outside her cottage into the gardens and we'd look up at the clouds and um, these enormous cumulonimbus clouds, she'd say, those are Archon's clouds and he's there. And she would wave and we would wave there, you know, and just little homely things about life on Meton. Could you go into some details about what she said? I know that it's all in her book, but perhaps she shared something with you that what is not in the book. Um, basically everything that's in the book. Uh, she did talk to me about the propulsion system and the formula, the seven figure formula, which I obviously can't divulge, but I do know it in my mind just as she did. And um I remember the one day she showed me this little impression in the soil. She called me out into the garden and I came running up and uh, she said, look, she said, that's from a scanning disc and that's in my book as well. And it was about the size of a dinner plate, a perfect impression in the soil. And I put my hand out to very gently touch it. I was so awed by this. And she said, that's from the scanning disc and they take samples of the soil you know, to examine it scientifically. And I remember also the day she gave me my little crystal. Um, but there's a picture of it in my book as well. It's, uh, it's a little crystal from Meton, and it was it's shaped in the shape of a heart. Um, and Elizabeth said it came from Archon's home and the mm. sea by his home. Mm. And the sea actually shaped it like that. Mm. And when my cousin, who's a geologist, came out from Canada, he was a doctor of geology and I asked him just to look at this little crystal for me mm -hmm. uh, to get a professional opinion. And he looked at it through his eyeglass and he said, yes, this has been shaped by the sea. It was most unusual. And he let me have a look. And when I looked through it, I saw all these tiny little crystals, like tiny little diamonds shining in the crystal. Mm. Um, it was really amazing. I've never seen anything like that. Mm. And it was very beautiful. So Elizabeth brought back quite a few crystals from Meton, she from did. the planet Meton. Because uh, uh, I, I saw you with um, uh, uh, on another interview with, uh, what was her name the, that you had? The Eleanor. With Eleanor. Eleanor. And she know. had a photograph of uh, the crystals that she had. And you yes. holding a crystal, you look, a, yes. you look to be in your early 20s then. And no, I was a teenager then. Were you a teenager, maybe about 17? Yeah. And did they have any special properties, the crystals, different to the crystals here on Earth? No, no. Yeah. Everything in the universe is the same. Mm -hmm. The only difference would be that it would, any crystal or rock from Meton would be older than any crystal or rock on Earth mm -hmm. because Meton is an older planet. Okay. Oh, so, you know, throughout the universe, things are basically the same. Nature is the same. Mm -hmm. And anything vastly different belongs to science fiction. Mm. Interesting. So with your background, it sounds like you're very academic and scientifically based. I'm sure that when, uh, when uh, Elizabeth shared the information, because she had an amazing intellect as well and scientific mind, yes. when she shared the information with you that she received from Archon and Archon's brother and different people from the Alpha Centauri system from Meton, you would have completely understood what she was talking about. Yes, she said, um, I've got a race memory. A race uh, memory. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. What does that mean? Well, it means um, you have a memory in your, in your cellular memory. Mm -hmm. It's like a memory from past lives. And you are born with certain knowledge. Yeah. You know, which comes from the race. Yeah. In other words, Archon's race. Yeah. Um, this is an earth life for me, a temporary one. Mm -hmm. um, my soul 
actually belongs to the Pleiades. It originated there, mm -hmm. as did Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. The Pleiades. Because I think yes. in the book, Elizabeth says that the Venusians uh, seeded the humans here on earth they were part of the seeding race of the so yes. their physical structure their human body yes. was a part of the human race and they also said um that they they created the the pyramids it says i've taken an expert yeah. excerpt out of her book we found the pyramids a type of construction most suitable for earth and mars where many earthquakes plagued us and radiation remained a hazard when they were uh, here on Earth and Mars. The pyramids were constructed by us and used yes. later by civilizations as places of worship or for burial. They are cosmic libraries. And in the time they would point the way to the stars, the human race of Earth will find an escape route to the stars and away from the violence within the sun system that is ver the variable nature creates. These pointers will give them clues. Those who find these clues will be eligible and free to follow us into the fathomless depths of space beyond the light barrier. Yeah. So they've left behind this technology, which is the pyramids, to as a gateway to the stars. Did she yes. discuss that with you? She did. And um, it's also like the Klerksdorp spheres, which she spoke about. Now, these are round spheres that were found, and nobody knew what they were. And when they cut them open, they saw rings, like the rings in a tree. Um, and she said, you know, in time, this is like a time capsule, and in time, it will point the way to the stars. So once people are ready and um, spiritually, you know, because they're not ready right now, uh, these, they will find the secrets in these spheres and the pyramids, and that will point the way to the stars together with the formula. Valerie, do you think that some of our secret governments have already got this technology? What do you think about that? Um, I think they do to a certain degree, mm -hmm. but they still need the seven-figure formula for the propulsion system. Uh, it's a very advanced alien science. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they have the figure now, they won't know what to do with it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, they will only go to the stars when they are ready because the space races won't allow them into space if they go on a warlike mission. Mm. They have to look after their planets and homes as well, mm -hmm. as well as the, the universe. Judging what's happening on planet Earth at the moment, we're not looking anywhere near ready, are we? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we're just not looking anywhere near ready. You know, I no. took another excerpt out of Valerie's, um, out of Elizabeth's book uh, today. The key to our existence in the universe is to be harmonically attuned with all things in nature if one is attuned one can take part in all things and be an active participant in the variable nature of the cosmos in this way one attains all knowledge and perception and can eventually make physical contact with people beyond earth's light barrier did she go into things like that with you about how yeah talk to us about that yes she did she did do you want to talk to us about <laughs> what she said to you? Um, well, basically, it was that, you know, what was in her book. Did she continue to have telepathic communication with Archon when you knew she her? Did. Mm -hmm. Yes, she did. And uh, in one of her books, she's actually got a photograph. Um, she's sitting on the veranda and there's this beam of light next to her. And a photographer was visiting her that day, taking photos. And... Um, he took this photo one split second later, and when he developed it, he saw this beam of light, a vertical beam of light next to Elizabeth. And she said, if you'd taken it a second later, you would have seen Archon in a hologram. So he would, see, he would send like holographic messages. Holograms of both he and Aileen. That's beautiful. It's a bit like we're on Zoom now looking at each other, except that they're using holographic technology, yes. right? I don't think yes. we're too far away from that on Earth. What do you think? No, no. They've Holo got holograms. They've yeah. developed it already. Mm. 
Yeah. So we could be sitting across my coffee table looking at each other in a, as, a, as a hologram rather than on a computer. Exactly. <laughs> and that's how she would communicate with him, is it? And ailing. Yes. His... And tele- by telepathy as well. Yeah. That's, that's mm-hmm. amazing. I think she said once they landed in Port Elizabeth as well uh, in the sea physically and she saw them there. But Aileen doesn't come to Earth regularly at all. Uh, he stays on Meton. He's got his own son and now a daughter as well. And mm-hmm. he travels the universe like his father, mm-hmm. monitoring the variable stars. And their time is very different to ours. It's hard for us to wrap our, uh, I had a bit of a chat about it in the introduction. It's hard for us to wrap our linear minds around how time works Uh, because when she was there for four months it was like nine years over there right yes so she experienced living like nine earth years but when she came back to uh, earth it it had only been four months Mm. so in that time she had given birth and mothered her son for approximately nine years is that right yeah, that's right. Um, because the vibration is higher and it's a higher dimension as well. So when we talk about them living for thousands of years or hundreds of years, it's not quite the same as our, our um, time. Yeah, you'd have to do the arithmetic <laughs> mm. to, to convert it. But it would be thousands of years, I think, in Earth time. Mm. But for their time, you'd have to start working out the arithmetic. And their their race doesn't age, like really age, like get old like we do and no, sick. They don't no. have any sickness. They don't get sick no. at all. No. What else did she tell you about their race no. that you remember? Um, well, it's it's literally a utopia. Um, the planet Meton is mostly seas with islands. There's no continents. And um, it's very, very beautiful. Um, the colors are brighter. Uh, They've got beautiful white horses, um, silkworm farms to make the silk robes that they wear, you know, and everything is treated with love and mm-hmm. cared for. They don't have roads or railways like we do on Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, the spaceships land on top of the houses. The houses are about three floors, but they're round in shape. Um, and then you just walk down the stairs. Um, so it's it's quite different to Earth. It it's really is more like paradise. And they have the most beautiful music as well. Um, there was a, a piano-type instrument there made of ivory or pearl. And uh, Elizabeth loved it because, you know, she studied music. And she hoped that uh, she would have one to play. And Archon said, maybe you will one day. Yeah. <laughs> I I remember I was saying in the intro that I have a friend who's a fourth generation pearl dealer and he has identified with being Venusian since he was a child and he remembers looking up at Venus saying I'll be here for as long as you need me but I I'm looking forward to coming home (laughs) so do I believe me I echo that (laughs) and when I showed him the book he was totally fascinated by the way that they use pearl on meton and mm. that the the keys to the sort of piano instrument were not made out of ivory as they are here they were made out of pearl and yes. the staircase was made out of pearl and she speaks about yes. being on the ship and being in a bath made out of pearl yes what else did she tell you about the pearl um well just about everything is made out of pearl there they use it a lot they really do use it a lot do you remember how they acquire the pearl? Because like what we understand as pearl is just tiny beads. You know, how do you make a staircase out of it? Did she t- explain yeah. how that works? Uh, no, not really. But um, they probably would f- um, farm the, the mussels, but they would treat them far better than we do here. And they would make sure that the mussels were happy and didn't run out of anything they needed. You know, they would be treated with respect. Yeah, I think it was a totally um, not different... exploited like on Earth. Yeah, I think it was a totally different technology to what we understand as completely. Pearls here. Yeah, yeah. Even the electricity they get from the atmosphere, mm. it's not like here. Yeah. yeah, there have yeah. been people that have invented machines that can 
generate electricity just from the atmosphere yeah. and magnetics that, like that Tesla. yeah that technology is is becoming known apparently there have been scientists that have developed that that have been uh you know put away because it threatened the economics of our current oh, system that's I mean, right <laughs> earth i tell you earth earth's a fun place to be here but um, you see yeah. you see they can't uh well they they could use a spaceship technology, but you see they won't because it threatens the oil cartels mm -hmm. and the financial institutions and the control that they have on this planet mm -hmm. and the money aspect and everything. The, um, to, to many UFO researchers and people involved in this sort of way of thinking, you know, a lot of people say, why haven't the aliens shown themselves to us? And it's like, hello, read Elizabeth's book. <laughs> they do all the time. And she's not the only one. There are millions of people across the planet that have had interaction right. with uh, star nation beings. Yeah. Um, I have to say, but Elizabeth's story just completely captured me. I, I don't know why. I think there were so many elements. There was the love element. There was the scientific element. There was the off-world, you know, experience living on another planet. And yes. there were so many elements to her story that I was mesmerized by. How did it change? Well, this... Yes, go on. Sorry. Sorry, go. Sorry go. carry on. I was going to say, how did, it, how did it change your life, you know, interacting with Elizabeth and hearing the stories? Um, it was very familiar to me I it was a natural thing you know a lot of people have difficulty believing there's life elsewhere but that comes from an egocentric point of view mm -hmm. you've got to have an open mind why would God create or the creator create life on one planet and nowhere else this universe is vast it's endless there are multiverses you know and we've only just gone to the moon or Mars <laughs> Um, there is life everywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in my book, um, I actually met two of them and I've mentioned it in my book as well. Um, I went to a meeting when Elizabeth launched her book, Beyond the Light Barrier. And um, my mother and I had to get a lift home. And Elizabeth arranged with us to get a lift with this lady. And this gentleman was with her. He was also getting a lift home um, now he would be what we call co a contact man and they come to earth and they disguise themselves as one of us so as to blend in with the population um, and then they can help us that way you know uh, instead of uh, suddenly appearing in a silver space suit and scaring everybody so he came and he had dark hair dark suit he was probably in his early 30s, and he was the epitome of a gentleman. And um, he and I actually got talking. We got on very well. And he wanted to know what I knew, so I was happily chatting to him. And the lady told me to keep quiet. She didn't want me to talk. So he said to her, why won't you let her speak? You know, let her talk. So he actually admonished her, and he wanted me to talk to him. So I did, I chatted away, I, don't know, I was a teenager again, I think, and um, we got on very well, and he was so sweet to me, really, uh, he had impeccable manners. Anyway, um, we got home, and we said goodbye and everything, and uh, I never saw him again, but when I went to see Elizabeth, I told her about this, and she said, oh my dear, I know exactly what you're talking about, that was a spaceman. And she had met one at one of her previous meetings as well. And then um, sometime before that, I was much younger as well. Uh, I was playing on the swings with my friends in the park. And there was this blonde man sitting under the tree watching us. Now, in those days, uh, it was quite safe for children to be quite far from home. So um, he came up and just asked us the time. And we happily told him. And then he said to us, would we like to walk with him down to the golf course? Now, where I lived, uh, it was there was a lot of greenery around. It was um, a river and the golf course and hills and everything. So we innocently said, yes, we'll come for a walk, you know, no problem. <laughs> so we trotted down the road with him, chattering away. And then he told us to go back. Once we got into the golf course, 
he said, now you must go back because um, he has to now say goodbye. So my two little friends turned around and they just went off. They didn't think twice about it. <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> um, I've always been different uh, to my family here. Um, everywhere I've been, I've always been different. And I've sensed things. And I sensed something about him. It was almost like a sixth sense, like with the other one. So he was walking off ahead of me and with his back to, towards me and I was behind him. So I just walked along. He sensed something. He turned around and he saw me there and I stopped and looked at him and he said, you must go back now because you will get lost. I will come back one day and we'll have a party. I didn't want him to go. I don't know why. I just, there was something subconscious I sensed about him. Anyway, he turned around and he walked off and I watched him disappear amongst the trees. And I waited and I waited and he didn't come back. So I thought, okay, he's not going to come back. So um, I turned around a bit crestfallen <laughs> and I walked home. Uh, I never did see him again, but uh, he had long blonde hair. It was typical of the Nordics, if you've ever read about them. And typical of the uh, people on Meton and the Pleiades. You know, the Nordics from era in the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. And um, when I met Eleanor, uh, I chatted to her about this. And then one lady who, brought my, who bought my book, I was having tea with her. And she actually said to me, that was probably your brother. Now, Eleanor, through her friend Thorhan, gave me a special message. And Thorhan said, oh, that Elizabeth and Archon are my parents in the Pleiades. And this blonde man was my brother there too. And he's keeping an eye on me. He's watching over me. Um, as Archon and Elizabeth are, because in 2016 and 2014, Archon came in his spaceship and I took photographs right above my head. And those photos are in my book. And the spaceship is exactly the same as Elizabeth's photos. Yeah. So... Uh, Thorhan said, I actually have my family there. And when I pass away after this earth life and this mission that I came to do, I will go back to them. Yeah, beautiful. So it's truly something to look forward to very, very much. Do you have telepathic communication with Elizabeth and Archon now? Yes, I do. I do. So, and what do they communicate with you? What do they say to you? Well, um, just the usual thing. They love me. They're watching over me. They are protecting me. Um, Archon promised Elizabeth he would look after me the same as he did her. Um, she did ask him and he promised to do that. Um, my brother is looking after me. Um, yeah. And also, I had a special message where Elizabeth said to me, I must be brave. Uh, I'm the last one here and just finished my mission and soon will be a family again. So that truly is something I am looking forward to. Mm -hmm. And are you in communication with her children? Yes, I, I know David and yeah. uh, he knows me very well. I mean, he's obviously known me since oh years and years and years. He's much older than I am. I was going to say he's older than you. How, how old are yeah. you now? How old are you now? Uh, that's sensitive for me. Just a, a ballpark, you know, 40s, 50s, oh, 60s. Oh, no, no, no. If you don't mind, I'll skip that one. So 50s? I don't know. So how old's, how old's David? Um, he will be uh, in his early 70s now. His 70s. So Elizabeth died at um, 80. How old was she when she died? 83, was it? 83. 83. She died in February 1994 and she was born in 1910. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And uh, and how do the, her, I suppose there's grandchildren, great-grandchildren now, how do they feel about, how does her family feel about her story? Because even though it's maybe not so well-known, in the ma in the mainstream world now it was in the 50s 60s and 70s quite 
yeah. renowned, quite well known. And then because of the collective conditioning, like you've got to be crazy to believe in aliens and all that sort of stuff, yeah. it kind of got, got buried. So I love that we're sort of digging it up again and presenting it to the world. And I would say to people, you know, share, 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 share the books, share the yeah. books, share the books, all the books, share the Well, story. David has one surviving daughter. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think she's very interested. I could be wrong. I, could, mm -hmm. I stand to be corrected. But I think she gets on with her own life. And um, most of Elizabeth's family really does get on with their own lives. Uh, she too was also very different to her family. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time she was alone. You know, she felt alone. It says in her book that she was quite different to her family and that she looked quite different. And so she wasn't of their DNA stock. Like, was right. she a hybrid? You know, was, how did how did her body, was she adopted? How did her body come to be in the family no, that she grew up in? She was, she was born into her family, but uh, she did have um, a bit of different DNA because Archon even said to her, you don't belong to this family. Right, yeah. Um, but she didn't elaborate too much on that. Okay. Uh, but he did say that. And uh, she said one day she would like to write a second book called Daughter of Venus. Okay. But um, she didn't get around to it. So that one wasn't written. The well, Gravity she, Files still the, has to be uh, published. Yeah, yeah, there's that documentary uh, with um, yeah. that. Is it an English lady? What's her name? Anyway, it's on YouTube, a documentary. Yeah. And she talks um, about... She's writing her second book, The Gravity Files, mm. where she says that she's going to divulge the scientific information to the propulsion mm. system or more of the scientific information. Mm. But I think that she left her body before she finished The Gravity Files. She did. Files. She did. Apparently it wasn't um, finished. And do you the think that someone will finish that? Could you finish that? Maybe? I probably could, but uh, David would have to give his permission. Yeah. And I cannot do anything without his permission. And have you spoken to David about that? I have. I have. And how does he feel Maybe about he, it? We're chatting about it. Yeah. You know, you know I, I would love to see this made into a movie. There's so many elements to the whole mm -hmm. story. You know, there's the South African beauty of the Drakon Berg's mountains and the spaceship and the Zulu and the, mm. you know, the, the growing up in the 50s, well, being in the 50s and, you know, close to Johannesburg. And there's so much to this story apart from the off-world being and going to Meton and also the Russians and the, and the, and the political, you know, the way that the, the army and the Navy or the Air Force were sort of chasing her down for the information. And, yeah, there's just so much to this story. It would make a fabulous movie, don't you reckon? It would indeed. We could put it you really in it. Would. Yeah, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> I and would she, be very honoured in just a little part. <laughs> well, she was so cultured like you, so artistic and scientific. She had busts of uh, Archon I don't think she'd made them though but she did paintings of him didn't she uh she did have a painting done by someone I don't know the name of the person oh okay she didn't do it herself is, that is the picture that everybody sees of Archon's head and shoulders uh that was an original oil painting that she had in the cottage mm -hmm. then she had the bust made by the late Bob Forbes mm -hmm. and she had her ferns and she had the ring from Archon as well. Yes, that's right. He gave her a ring. Do you know what happened? Does David have all her crystals and the stuff that she got from Meton? What happened um, to all the trinkets from Meton? They were distributed amongst her close friends and family. Mm -hmm. and that's how I got my little crystal too. And although she gave it to me personally before she died. Um, I'll always remember that moment though. It was uh, very beautiful one day in the garden with my mother and she said I'm going to give you something and she gave me this little crystal and she said it's come all the way from Meton a long way to you and then she explained to me about it being shaped by the sea and everything and oh my mum was also quite overawed at this what a gift my goodness all the money in the world could never never buy something like this it is priceless 
and it is so precious to me. And what did your mother think of her story? Was she a believer? Oh, she did. She was very open-minded, and I was very lucky to have her as a mother because I could talk to her about anything, literally anything. And, and where and, you, you live in South Africa, are you in the city or whereabouts are you in South Africa? Uh, I'm in country? Johannesburg, in oh, so eastern in, Johannesburg, so just on the city. edge. On the and edge. What's the feeling in Johannesburg? What's the, the people, do you, can you talk openly about this to many people or do you find people still are skeptical? Um, how, did, how is it in, South, in Johannesburg in South Africa? A lot of people are still, they don't know about this. Um, they're still very ignorant mm -hmm. or earthbound. Mm -hmm. They're too busy getting on with their lives. Yeah. It's just certain people that have open minds that you can talk to. And uh, I'm lucky that I do have a few friends like that. Um, there are people mostly who knew her. There's a lady that lives in Nottingham Road in Natal. She's just got my book. And uh, we've just got this friendship that it's just amazing because we both knew her. Mm -hmm. um you know so it's really the people who knew her that i get on um very well with the ordinary man in the street is still ignorant they have no idea well i you know I, i've been doing this for oh, i don't know 30 odd years uh, showcasing new old teachers and as a healer and a teacher myself and what i find is when you open up publicly you, you, you might find a few that sort of say, oh, you're crazy, but there'll always be one or two that go, I have a story, yeah. and they've kept it a secret their whole lives. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many out there. Do you find that when you speak about this? Uh, yes. Once I open up mm -hmm. and I talk, then people feel confident enough to speak themselves. Mm -hmm. And then we get very animated into the subject, you know. And it's, it's actually lovely. It really is lovely. I mean, like, for example, when I was on the SABC3 talk mm -hmm. um, in the early 2000s, we had two shows there. And we had a panel of four. And uh, the first show, uh, well, they were both a success. They were both a resounding success. But the first one, <laughs> I'll always remember, they could actually send in SMSs with questions, you know, and phone in with questions after the formal show and the computer crashed no. um, but it couldn't cope it had one just short of 10,000 sms's and phone calls it couldn't wow. cope with it so um people wanted to know there they wanted to know yeah you see and then they said well we can do a second show because of the success so we had a second show and you know it was okay the computer didn't crash on the second show but it was also very successful and then the Jeff Renz show, that was in America, and I did that by phone. Um, I went into work late that day. I got permission to go in late. And they phoned me from America, and I spoke to Jeff Renz on the phone. Um, and they interviewed, uh, it was David, the Wilsons who owned the property, the Tauby property, another friend of Elizabeth and me, and we each had 15 minutes. And um, we spoke about Elizabeth, and that you can hear on the YouTube, the uh, yeah, on the YouTube Yahoo satellite. Um, if you go into Jeff Rings's archives, you should be able to find it. But it's a long time ago. All oh, right. So he has a YouTube channel, does he, Jeff Rings? Yeah. yeah. And, and um, oh, okay. So if we put in maybe your name or her name, it would come up or, on his yeah. YouTube. Well, hopefully they would. They've kept it. <laughs> I hope they've kept it. Imagine what a Hollywood blockbuster movie would do for this story. This is my dream. I'm not going to make it. I'm not a movie maker, but I hold that vision of seeing, yes. you know, the book made into a movie because it would really get that message out there to the world because mm. it's based on a true story. You know, mm. uh, yeah, it's, I love watching movies based on true stories, especially movies yeah. that seem yeah. so extraordinary. It, you know, it, it's... Uh, I'm sure one will be made. Yeah, I hope so. I hold I'm that sure. vision. Just, just the beauty of South Africa, just to, yeah, the beauty of South Africa. And, and we've, got, we've got the technology now to be able to do the CGI for all the inside of the ship and everything. You, you can all do yes. that all on CGI. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. it would be great. Elizabeth painted pictures with her words because I love the part in her book where she's talking about the Zulus mm, uh, and their I. folklore, yeah. the lightning bird. 
mm -hmm. with the rainbow colors, um, you know, and then she, she actually was fluent in Zulu. Mm. So um, she brings those words into her book and it really, really paints this wonderful picture. Mm, beautiful. You know? what, were, what else would you like to share with people about your, about your life and your time with Elizabeth Clara? Um, it was a very ordinary life. There was nothing extraordinary about it. Um, I remember the one time I made a picture for Archon and Ailing. My mom and I had gone to Durban for a holiday. It was the last holiday I had with my mom before she died. And I collected these little seashells off the beach. And I made this photo of this picture uh, for, it, for them. It was a photo of the sea and then a border of shells. And I remember washing each and every single shell in the hotel bath uh, immaculately because you have to be careful. You can't, you've got to get all the bugs and the germs off. <laughs> so um, I made this and I gave it to Elizabeth. Now, because I was still at school, I couldn't go with her to the farm. So I said to her, please, will you give this to them? And she said she would. And when I saw her again, she, I said, did they like it? She said, oh, they loved it. Archon loves seashells and Ailing sends his love. So um, I was very, very touched by that. They really liked it. And other than that, it was just a normal life. I used to sleep in the major art, uh, Fielding's art studio when she had her meetings at Towerby once a month. Um, I remember she, they, everybody would crowd into the art studio uh, while someone gave a talk. And then they would usually finish about 10 o'clock and Major Fielding was in charge of the parking. Um, <laughs> so everybody had to get their cars inside the, the grounds. Uh, it was really quite cramped, but anyway, look, it did work. And uh, I had to wait for everyone to go home before I could go to bed. And then <laughs> she, <laughs> she had Major, three signs. Uh, huh? Sorry? Was Major Fielding her last husband? Yes. And yes. she met and married him after her encounter yes. with Archon. Yes. So she had a couple yes. of husbands before that, didn't she? She did. She uh, did. Two, three? I can't mm. remember. Do you two. Uh, two. Two. It was um, Marilyn's father, Major Phillips. All uh, majors. David, <laughs> <yeah>. David's father. <laughs> David's, David's father, Paul Clara, and then Major Fielding. Oh, okay. So she kept Paul Clara's mm. last name. Mm, she didn't change it yeah, yeah. and anyway uh, so she had three Siamese cats and they would always clamber all over me because you know Siamese cats are very fussy about people but these three took to me so they were climbing all over me and Elizabeth loved it and she would burst out laughing you know <laughs> I had cats in my face everywhere <laughs> and uh one night um we were going to sleep and uh, I was in the going to bed and one of the cats came to me to sleep with me. She had the other two and she was looking for the third one. So she said, called out to me. She said, is Clea or Lyra or Misty, whichever one it was, uh, is she with you? I said, don't worry, she's with me. So she said, that's fine. Okay, good night, dear. And uh, <laughs> we all went to sleep quite happily. And I loved going to sleep there with the cat on my bed. That's beautiful. Were the meetings that she used to have, were they about art or were they about off-world beings? Off-world beings, the UFOs. Um, so she, used she to was have regular chairperson. meetings. Mm -hmm. She was chairperson of Contact South Africa. Oh, right. So she would have her meetings there. And a lot of people came. Wow. There were a lot of people. I remember that. And do those meetings still exist where you are? Do you go to those meetings? No. No, no, I think it's fallen away. I can't find anything more about them. Maybe, and even her. Maybe you could start yeah. them up again, Valerie. <laughs> uh, maybe, but my flat is very small, so I couldn't accommodate. You know, I'd have to find some other premise, premises um, for that sort of thing. Oh, other premises will come along. You'll meet someone, they'll have a yeah. big house, or you could do it in their house, a hall will become available. <laughs> A church hall, a school hall, something yeah. will become available. Uh, it's time. Um, it's time. I actually did have meetings, come to think of it. I did have meetings at the Theosophical Society in Johannesburg mm -hmm. uh, for a while. We tried to get that going and people did come there, mm. you know. 
Um, and then life sort of kicked in and it sort of fell away. That was a success for a while. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. I've had a couple of people in South Africa on the show. I've been on another fellow's show who was in South Africa. I think he said he was moving to the States. And then another couple who channel the angels. So I could, could connect you to some like-minded people if you like. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a different topic, but um, yeah, it's good to it's good to be around people that where you can share yeah. this information with because it's such it's such amazing information, you know. And um, and, th and there's so many people out there now who want to share it and and having showcased New World teachers for so many years and and helped people awaken to their spiritual path. I hear a lot. I feel so alone in what I understand. And I've got no one to oh. talk to. And so they come on Zoom, oh. they come on the internet, yeah. but but they are out there. As I say, there's so many people out there who have had experiences yes. like you or who are, who are oh. those space, space race in yeah. a physical body, yeah. in a human body, yeah. can't tell anybody. And, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's good to gather. When I was still living at home, I saw spaceships in the sky. Um, sorry, that's my parrot. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an African grey. <laughs> um, I saw spaceships in the night sky on three occasions and very strong telepathy. Um, the first one was a, a, a white light in the sky and I had very strong telepathy telling me to go and look out of the window. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, but, you know, being an amateur astronomer, I knew if there was anything of interest out there or not. And at the time, there wasn't. So I thought to myself, but there isn't really anything out there to look at tonight. But this feeling that was so overwhelming. You know, I, even I couldn't resist it. So I thought, well, OK, I'll go and look out of the window. So I went into my bedroom, opened the window, looked up at the sky. Now we had uh, we faced south so I had the hills on the golf course and it was wide open and the sky was wide open and that was the best part of living there it was literally like in the country it was beautiful and I looked up in the sky and then suddenly this white light appeared and it zigzagged all over and then it stayed there for a bit and then disappeared it literally just winked out now being an amateur astronomer I knew that no natural object does that and nothing that um that has been sent up like a satellite or anything behaves like that so that definitely was unusual and uh, the whole experience was unusual and i also felt like time had stopped it was the weirdest feeling you know everything was just suddenly dead silent and it was dark at night um and then suddenly, you know, it had gone and then everything was normal again. And somebody else who bought my book also said, you know, you might have been taken aboard the ship at that time and had missing time. And then they returned you. And if my mother had come to my bedroom, she probably wouldn't have seen me there, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. Now, that was like something new for me because I didn't actually think of that. Yeah. And then, so I've been mulling over that one and I'm trying to, you know, I'd like to find out what happened then. I've just got to find somebody who can help me. And then um, on the second and third occasion, there was an orange light, same deal. And then the red one was the size of the moon. The other two were about the size of Venus uh, in the night sky. And then this one was the size of the, of the moon, but it was red. And I was sitting on my bed trying to do something. And I looked up at the window, it was about 11 o'clock at night. And I saw this red light there. And I thought, man, that's a bit strange. I wonder what that is. But before I could get outside, it had winked out. Mm. So but I wrote all these observations down, I made notes, you know, like an astronomer does mm -hmm. with the um, declination, right ascension and everything. And I've still got those to this day. And I gave them to Elizabeth and she said she's going to give them to the Air Force, South mm. African Air Force. Mm. So that was the beginning. And then after that, um, Elizabeth and Archon and then Archon ship in 2014 and 2016. 2014, I was in England at the time, uh, visiting my family there. And uh, I went outside and took photographs and Archon ship appeared. And then uh, the same here in South Africa in um, 2016 in Krugersdorp. 
right over my head. I was snapping away and the ship appeared. So I have two very beautiful photographs. Have you seen anything since? Have you noticed any uh, yes. things happening in the sky since? since? 2013. Oh, yes, since yeah. 2013. Um, I got thousands, literally thousands of photographs of ships that came from Mirak, um, which is in Andromeda. Now, this is a different civilization, mm -hmm. but they also know Archon and they were visiting me. Mm -hmm. um, every day I went out, I got photographs of them. Mm -hmm. Incredible photographs. You can see the portholes and um, the energy fields and everything around the ship. Wow. Absolutely wow. amazing. Do you have, you don't have a website. I think you, we've got to get you a website. No, but I do have a Facebook group for Elizabeth. Okay. What's uh, the it's, just called, it's just called Elizabeth Clara. There's a picture of her sitting in a pink dress in mm -hmm. the garden. Mm -hmm. um, so if people want to join that, they're more than welcome. And do you share your photographs in the Facebook group? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they can that. join that if they like. Yeah, but not everybody is on Facebook, so it's quite good to have a website. And websites are free and easy to manage these yeah. days. Uh, what, was, what else was I going to say to you? Um, oh, before I asked you that question, I had another question posed in my head and it's gone. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's gone back. So I suppose <laughs> we'll, what are you hoping the book will do for people, your book? Well, I hope that it will uh, continue an interest in Elizabeth mm -hmm. um, because it does carry on from The Light Barrier. It tells of her life after that book. Mm -hmm. And also um, now three planets have been discovered orbiting Proxima Centauri, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is um, proving her story true. Right, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And it will be, in time, the other four will be found because it's actually seven planets. That seven orbit, planets, that's right. Um, yeah. Proxima. Yeah. I know what I was going to ask you before. She lived to a ripe old age, and I know that she wanted to sort of be back on Meton with Archon. Mm -hmm. Do you know, did, did she speak to you about why she lived so long? Was it that mission to share her story you know to keep I living. think it was yeah yeah mm -hmm. it was but then she also um being in an earth body she got ill she got you ill know? Mm -hmm. and um she was struggling with that yeah. and then she moved with David down to um Natal and then she was ill so she had to go into hospice and then she passed mm. away were you there with her when she passed no unfortunately not um I wish I had been, mm -hmm. but you know, it's very difficult when you're working, your job doesn't let you give time off and mm. that, you know. But you're uh, still in communication with her now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. She yeah. didn't want to leave me and I didn't want to leave her. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And she oh. said, you know, I got a message afterwards. She said when she passed over, she said there were these golden beings holding out their hands to take her home. Wow. So um, she was able to tell me that as well. Did she have a physical body on Meton that her soul was inhabiting? Um, uh, okay, she had one on the Pleiades, uh, the star we call Tegita. Mm -hmm. uh, there uh, in Pleiadian, it's called Ashara. Mm -hmm. And um, in Planet Era, she had her Pleiadian body there in stasis, as mine is. Right. And um, she returned when she passed away. She again, Thorhan told me this uh, through Elena. Uh, she went back to her body there, was resuscitated, and then she went to live with Archon or Meton. And it will be the same with Elena as well, and with me as well. So, um, yeah, it's a very advanced alien technology. We come here to use this body to operate in this third dimensional planet to mm. um, have a mission to educate earthlings to help with the ascension mm -hmm. and that and then when that's done we go back home again mm -hmm. well you go and back to another physical experience I, I, yes. I call home you know the spirit yeah. side like yeah. where we come all souls come yeah. from but, we'll we'll uh, wake up there and carry on with our lives there again yeah carry on there is yeah yeah 
Yes, as I say, time because, and space. you know, the body is only temporary. The soul is eternal. Right. And the soul is the real you. Yeah. So yeah. that never dies. Yeah. And your body is like your clothes that you put on. You just put on a new set of clothes, take them off, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and you carry on. Yes. You know? I know, so beautiful. Well, Valerie, thank you so much for taking because you've you've gone way over your thirty minutes that you said you were going to talk. Ah, to me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's, it's been so pleasure. beautiful to speak with you and uh, to hear your story. I'd love, I'd love you to speak more and get that book out there. If, if there's anything I can do to help you, I'll do it. And if anybody else has some thank technical you. skills, maybe you're in South Africa, maybe you know someone in Johannesburg or in South Africa that can come and help Valerie you know, get this message out there and continue on Elizabeth's mission. Uh, maybe you're a filmmaker. You. <laughs> Make it into a yeah. movie. Uh, we'll yeah. all come over to South Africa and be a part of the crew. Be, be gorgeous. Okay. I, I, I imagine the being in the mountains there, just beautiful. Mm. Thank you so much for talking. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'm honoured to be on your show and I really do thank you for the privilege. There you go. Well, she wasn't her niece after all, just a good friend. But uh, she said that Elizabeth treated her like a daughter. And she said that, um, that yeah, she felt like her daughter. Yeah. We were just chatting after the show, as usual. And I was thinking, oh, I wish we had recorded this. The book, The Gravity Files, which Elizabeth didn't finish before she passed on, uh, she had to sign the Secrecy Act. And she, uh, Valerie was saying that, Originally, the information that's in the Gravity Files was in the original book, Beyond the Light Barrier. But when the governments read it, they said, no, you can't divulge this information. And she had to sign a Secrecy Act and then take that information out of the book. And when the Secrecy Act had expired, then she was allowed to publish it. So that's why right at the end of her life, when she was like 83, 82, 83, which I think is when she's being interviewed on that documentary that I mentioned, I'll put the link in the description. Uh, she talks about completing the second book, but then she didn't finish the second book. So uh, Valerie has, has that information. And I said, do you think that you could publish it as a, you know, a note or a PDF? It doesn't have to be a book. Offer it free to people. And she said she has to ask David, her son, because uh, he owns the um, information. And I said, well, ask him. You're in contact with him. Ask him. Get the information out there. Because I think it's more science, the gravity files. It's more science into their, yeah, propulsion systems. And I don't know what else. I don't know what, what's in it. But uh, I was saying to Valerie, I, was, I wish I could talk to Elizabeth. I'd have so many questions for her. And my guides reminded me, you can talk to Elizabeth. <laughs> Just sit down and talk to her. And I'm like. Right, telepathically. I can, can't I? I should do that. I should ask her all those questions that I have uh, about her time on another planet. Yeah, beautiful. Mm, fascinating story. Yes, the book is free and available to read online or you can buy it on Amazon. I'm not sure if it's still available on Amazon. Uh, if you want the physical book uh, or send me an email, I'll send you the PDF of the book, uh, Beyond the Light Barrier, Elizabeth's book. I don't think she's too worried about making money about uh, uh, of it. And even if she, the money, I don't know, where does the money go? Does it go to her family? I don't know. But anyway, it's good to get, I think she's more concerned about getting this information out there than she's about making money, especially since she's not on earth. Something that she talked about on Meeton, they have no monetary system. Everything is abundant and everything is provided free. Everything, it's all abundant and free it's a utopian society oh read the book just to revel in that you know just revel in that utopian society and as we think about that and dream about that your thoughts create your reality remember so as you dream about what could be you bring that into existence as you use your powerful focus and imagination and attention to focus on what you want instead of focusing on the dramas of our world because as we focus on the dramas in our world and get upset about it and judge others and criticize, we just keep perpetuating, reprinting, restamping that same old energy back into existence. But as we shift our focus to a more beautiful way of living and revel in, you know, what listening to her or reading about her being in a bath made of pearl and being in this warm, liquid, soapy, um, sort of uh, 
herbal bath. Uh, there was no soap. Actually, she said there was no soap. It was like herbal spices in this bath that would completely cleanse your body in this pearl bath. And then as she got out of the bath, this is on the ship, she gets out of the bath and instead of a towel, to, the, there was just this beautiful warm air that dried her off and she put on this delicious silky uh, garment that just, oh, you know, like it's just beautiful. This is on the ship and, uh, yeah, just beautiful. I just love being able to traverse the cosmos or even traverse the planet in a spaceship, in a, you know, in an anti-gravitic vehicle, instead of having cars, there's no roads, no train lines on their planet scarring the earth. There's just this natural beauty. And if you want to see it, you just hover over it in the ship and there's no noise to your ship, no pollution. I was, I was sure when I was a kid that when I grew up, I would be driving a flying car you know, that there would be like the Jetsons. So here I am, I'm well and truly grown up, overgrown up by now, you know, <laughs> getting on and there's no flying cars. We're still running around in petrol vehicles, polluting our planet, go figure. So we all have to focus on what we want, don't we? We all have to start focusing on what can be instead of putting all our powerful attention on what is. That's why I love this book so much. Yeah, just fabulous. There's so many excerpts I wrote out of the book, just millions of them. Uh, the electromagnetic waveform or light is the unified field of matter and antimatter throughout the universe, Akon explains to her, turning back to watch the viewing lens as we approach the great mothership. So this is when she's in the ship and Akon is explaining things to her. We move within the protection of our spaceship as she alters the wavelength of light to create a shift in space and time for movement from one point to another. They explain how they move through space. It's quite amazing. And also, unlike our spaceships where there's no gravity, they have the ability to utilise the environment to create gravity inside their ships. So it's like being on a planet when you're in a ship, which is a lot of the Hollywood movies depict Anyway, but when you see, you know, the reality of our spaceships, you see all these wires and them in cramped spaces and they're floating around and they're, you know, it's a very different, it's a very different story. Yeah, we've got a long way to go in this world with our science, I have to say. A mathematical formula for all transportation lies in the vibratory frequency of the light harmonic with anti-gravitic, anti-gravity waves and time waves, which are simply the frequency rate between each pulse of the spiral of light. By controlling this frequency weight, the rate, the flow of time can be varied and one simply moves within one's environment, within the protection of the spaceship instantaneously from one planet to another or from one solar system to another. Time as a geometric is controlled and eliminated. <laughs> so you just move instantly from Earth to wherever you want to go. Yeah, folding time space, folding time space. Mental forces, spiritual strength, soul attainment and thoughts are all made up of micro atoms of different speeds in the wavelength of light. Electricity is compromised of micro atoms of light. And while sound and color occur when the micro atoms have different speeds, when micro atoms are stopped, they create heat. Light is an intelligence energy that can be thought into existence and substance. The pattern of the micro atoms of light alter with changing thoughts when one achieves the formula for the harmonic vibration of light. The key to all life and the universe lies in the harmonic interaction of light. Yep, it's all light and we're manipulating it and creating it with thought energy that's why i say it's so important to focus on what you want because when you think you create when you imagine you create when you worry you create 
when you look at something, you create, when you judge something, not only do you create, you bring it into the density of physical environment, judgment, when you judge something, when you believe, you bring what you believe into your physical manifestation, as Wayne and I would say, you have to believe it to see it. You'll see it. You see it when you believe it. You'll see it when you believe it. When you believe, when you believe that energy of belief and knowing manifests into your dimension, into this dimension, into this reality and becomes your reality. Belief and judgment, powerful forces in our world, powerful forces. Ooh, I love this book. I love this story. Anyway, read the book. Let me know what you think. I'd love to talk about it. I could talk about it all day. I just love it. I love the science in the book, actually. I don't understand all of it, but I love it. I wonder if I'm from there. Pretty sure I have. Yep, they're saying, yep, yep, yep. Got the Venus connection. Absolutely. I probably live there in some body on some planet in the Alpha Centauri star system and the Pallades, they're saying, and Arcturus, Arcturus and the Andromedan system. Yep, I'm all over the place. Yeah, I get around. Anyway, but I have no memory of these lives because I'm here to do it. I'm here specifically to do a job, which I'm doing by talking to you on the show <laughs> and uh, to, to have this physical life experience, this human life experience. Yeah. Anyway, it's been wonderful to chat with you all again. I uh, just, just, just loved this conversation. What do you think of Valerie? She's very shy. It took me six months to get her on the show because I wanted to get her on the show last year and she cancelled. She said, oh, I don't think I can do it. She didn't give me any reasons. And yeah, she said, I can only give you 30 minutes. And then she gave me more. But yeah, anyway, she's very shy. But um, she did well. She did really, really well. Who's coming up in the Inner Sanctum next month as our guest teacher? Vivian Chauvet. Chauvet. Vivian Chauvet. Vivian has been on the show before. She's a hybrid soul from the Andromeda and Arcturian systems. And uh, she's amazing too. So we're getting galactic, more galactic stuff. She's going to join us on March 12th, US 13th next month in the Inner Sanctum. You're all welcome to join. If you want to join us on Zoom and, and ask Vivian questions, join up on my website, the Inner Sanctum. Just put your email in and I'll add you to the group that I send the I send the Zoom invitation out to. I'm also streaming them live on my YouTube channel. Uh, but it's great to be able to like face to face with Vivian or, or the guests or me and, you know, to ask her questions. People are very shy, I find. They turn off their cameras. And then my guest is speaking to all these names or blank screens <laughs> because they worry about being <laughs> seen on my YouTube channel. But anyway, so I've got the, I can spotlight people so that you're not live on my YouTube channel if you want to keep your privacy. Uh, and ask your questions on YouTube, yeah, on, on Zoom and, and meet our guests and meet me. And we also always have a chat before I turn on the recording and the live and afterwards we have a bit of a group conversation. So join us in the Inner Sanctum uh, guest speakers. And uh, yeah, remember to check out the book Awakened by Death, the book I put out if you haven't already. Thanks again for listening and watching. Big love to all of you. Bye for now.